Anatomy and Physiology 1, Chapter 5, Integumentary System. So the integumentary system is our first full system that we'll be talking about after tissues. Integumentary system or the integument is another way of saying the skin and it is the largest system in your body, makes up 16% of your weight and we can separate it into two main parts, the skin itself which is the cutaneous membrane and the accessory structures, which would be things like hair, nails, and glands. So we'll talk about all of those by the time we end chapter 5. So focusing in on the skin first, also known as the cutaneous membrane, we can divide it into two smaller sections, an epidermis, which is superficial, meaning um, outside of your body or close to the surface, and in this case on the surface. And that would be the epidermis, which is made of epithelial tissue. And if you recall in chapter 4, epithelial tissue was tissue that lined or covered internal or external body surfaces. We also talked about how epithelial tissue was avascular, meaning no direct blood supply and it was made up mostly of cells. So this is going to be our top layer, the epidermis, made of epithelia. And then the inner layer is known as the dermis, which is made mostly of connective tissue. And that was something else we talked about in chapter 4, connective tissue being tissue that contains cells, a ground substance, which is what the cells are suspended in, and also fibers. So it is not all cells, just like epithelia. So again, the epidermis and dermis make up the cutaneous membrane or skin. The accessory structures originate from the dermis, which is the deeper layer, and extend through the epidermis to the skin surface. They're going to include hair and the follicles for the hair, exocrine glands, those are glands that secrete products through a duct, which we also talked about in chapter 4, and then nails. So the integument or skin contains blood vessels and sensory receptors, so we can feel through our skin, and under the skin or cutaneous membrane, we have the subcutaneous layer, which is known as the hypodermis. And it is made of loose connective tissue, a lot of fat or adipose in this area, and again found below the dermis, as the subprefix indicates. <clears throat> So in this image, we can see all three layers. So the cutaneous membrane um, is made up of the epidermis and the dermis. So we can see the epidermis here, which is thinner than the dermis, and is made up exclusively, for the most part, of tightly packed cells. And then the dermis, which runs from here all the way down to here, has its own layers as well, which we will talk about in just a minute. And you can see the dermis is very active. We've got glands, blood vessels, hair, and then the subcutaneous layer, which is also known as the hypodermis, is found at the very deepest point. So this would be right before you touch muscle under the bone, or under the skin, excuse me. So the accessory structures, we have hair, again, we have glands like this one, and also like this one. 
we have um, nails in some areas which we can't see in this particular image but you can also see blood vessels and you can see um, tactile corpuscles which are going to have to do with the nervous system and sensation so lots of stuff crammed in the skin so the functions of the integument is a good place to start um, we need the skin because it's going to protect our tissues and organs that are internal it's going to separate them from the outside world we're going to be able to get rid of waste through our skin by sweating so excretion of salt water and organic waste our skin helps us to maintain a normal body temperature by keeping us cool when we sweat and by the fat that we store in our skin that act as, acts as insulation when we are cool we produce melanin in our skin which is a brown black pigment we produce keratin in our skin which is a protein that makes our skin water resistant we can make vitamin D in the skin we'll talk about that too we store lipids we can feel through the skin touch pressure and pain and our skin also is part of the immune system okay so in this slide here which kind of summarizes what we've talked about so far the whole integument or skin is composed of the cutaneous membrane and accessory structures we've got an outline of the functions of the skin up here that we just went through the cutaneous membrane is made of the epidermis which is largely cells its epithelial and the dermis which is connective tissue the dermis also has two layers which we're going to talk about in just a second and then accessory structures include hair glands and nails we'll also visit those individually so starting with the epidermis and going into a bit more detail the epidermis is made of stratified squamous epithelium and if you remember from chapter 4 stratified means many layers squamous or squamous is thin and flaky and epithelium again lines or covers internal and external body surfaces it is avascular so no blood vessels in it which is true for all epithelia so nutrients and oxygen must diffuse into the epithelium from capillaries in the dermis which would be below the epidermis so here's a picture again of the skin and we can see the epidermis and part of the top part of the dermis so the epidermis here has been peeled back to reveal a wavy underside and that wavy underside those waves are called epidermal ridges and you can see that the dermis has similar bumps or waves on it too so what do you think happens when we allow the epidermis to rest on the dermis they're going to interlock like puzzle pieces so the epidermis again has the wavy ridges called epidermal ridges and then the dermis has similar waves in it that are called dermal papilla the word papilla means nipple shaped which I think is pretty memorable so the nipple shaped projections will interlock with the epidermal ridges like puzzle pieces interlock and this will create a nice tight grip between the two layers so the cells of the epidermis are called keratinocytes these are skin cells that are filled with keratin and keratin again is a water resistant protein it's very tough very fibrous which we definitely would like our skin to be 
And our skin in the epidermis can come in two variations. We have thin skin, which is what we find on most areas of the body. It has four layers of strata. Um, and we'll look at the strata in just a few minutes. But the strata are basically sections of keratinocytes. And each one of those strata is going to have different things going on in it. So thin skin has four layers of strata which contain keratinocytes or skin cells. Thick skin is where um, we would find that in areas where we're going to have a lot of abrasion. So areas like the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. And in the thick skin we're going to have five layers of strata which contain keratinocytes. So we're going to take a look at both of those to do a comparison. So here's a, a, a microscopic image of a section through thin skin. And it's a little hard to tell, but we're going back to what we talked about in chapter four. Um, and here we can see the basement membrane. And in chapter four, we talked about how the basement membrane was where the epithelia began. So anything above that basement membrane is going to be considered epithelial tissue. And in the skin, that would mean the epidermis. So from about there to about there would be the epidermis of thin skin. So thin skin has about four layers of specific um, stage keratinocytes. And thin skin is about as thick as the wall of a plastic sandwich bag. Um, so about 0 0.08 millimeters. So that's pretty thin, but remember we're just talking about the epidermis. That does not include the dermis, which is part of our cutaneous membrane. So in thick skin, we have five layers of strata. And this is going to begin at the basement membrane and move its way up. So I'm going to show you this in an image as well so you can see where these layers of strata are and I will make sure to let you know which one of these is not present in thin skin because remember thin skin just has four of these layers of strata. So when we keep referring to strata these bullet points here are what we're talking about. So at the very bottom closest to the basement membrane we have the stratum basal um, and some books will refer to it as the stratum germinativum. So either one of those would be acceptable. We then have on top the stratum spinosum, followed by the stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and at the very top where you actually touch your own skin would be the stratum corneum. So this would be what it would look like um, if we could see these layers. So this is a cross section through thick skin and you can see that it does in fact look quite a bit thicker than the thin skin we just looked at. So we find our basement membrane which is right here at the arrow and from there all the way up to the top is thick skin. And remember we're just talking about the epidermis only right now um, and right up here where my arrow is this is what you would touch if you touched your own skin right now okay so the thick skin is divided into layers of strata as we go up so let's start at the very bottom so down here we have the stratum basal or stratum germinativum it's the deepest layer and attaches to the basement membrane. So it would be about in here. And what's really cool about the stratum basal is this is where stem cells live. And stem cells are cells that rapidly, well not necessarily rapidly all the time, but they constantly divide. And I guess for skin it would be pretty quick because we do shed skin constantly. So because we're shedding skin, off the top constantly we have to be producing new skin to replace the skin that we shed. So stratum basal contains stem cells that are going through mitosis. So this will enable us to produce new 
skin cells. Um, so here it gives you some of that in the notes. So again, attached to the basement membrane by hemidesmosomes. Hemidesmosomes we talked about also in chapter four. Those anchor the epithelial tissue down to connective tissue. Um, and the stratum basal also is where the epidermis and dermis meet and bond. We have epidermal ridges in the stratum basal, and those are the ones we talked about that fit with the dermal papilla, like a lock and key or two puzzle pieces. And there are basal cells that, um, or which are stem cells that produce new skin cells. Okay, so we looked at where that was down here at the bottom. So we want to move up now to the next layer of strata. Before we do, let's touch on one more thing um, regarding the epidermal ridges. So epidermal ridges are very noticeable and steep on the fingertips. And because they are so noticeable and steep on the fingertips, they actually cause the skin to ripple on the surface and we call those fingerprints. And in between these epidermal ridges that are on your fingertip are little sweat gland pores. So the sweat glands are constantly oozing sweat and every time you touch something, you are leaving a stamp of sweat in the shape of your individual epidermal ridges. Okay, and fingerprints are useful because they make the tips of your fingers a little bit more rugged and that gives you better gripping ability. Okay, so in the basal, before we move on to our next layer, we have tactile discs called Merkel cells. And Merkel cells are cells that have sensory nerve endings. So they respond to touch and this will give us some sensation in our skin. And we'll also find down deep at the basal, the melanocytes. <clears throat> and melanocytes are cells that produce the pigment melanin, which is a brown black pigment in the skin. So moving up from the basal, we have the stratum spinosum, also known as the spiny layer. And it will have about eight to 10 layers of keratinocytes that are stuck together by desmosomes. That's another throwback to chapter four. Desmosomes are interlocking proteins that connect one cell to its neighbor. And that's gonna allow the um, skin to form sheets. When we look at these cells under a microscope, they look a bit spiny, which is why they're called the spiny layer. They are the daughter cells, so the newly produced cells from the stratum basal. And we also see in this layer cells called Langerhans cells, which are helpful in immune response. So if you were to get a cut and some bacteria was introduced to the skin, these guys could help fight um, for your immune system. Okay, so let's go back and look at the spinosum. So here is the spinosum, which would be on top of the basal. These are newly produced cells connected by desmosomes. Okay, so we're gonna move up now to the granulosum. And the granulosum is about right in here, shows up a little darker. Okay, so this is the granular layer. It contains three to five layers of keratinocytes, which are produced from the cells of the spinosum. So we're, we're going up, we're on top of the spinosum now. Most of these cells will stop dividing and begin to produce keratin, which is again our water resistant protein. After these cells produce protein, the cells begin to die. So as we move closer to the top of the skin, we're going to see that the very top layer of skin 
that the cells are dead. And this is good because this top layer of skin is our protection layer. And what a great protectant than something that's dead because you can't hurt it. So it's, as we get closer to the top, we're going to see that the cells are not alive. Okay, so stratum lucidum, and we'll go back and look at that in our picture in just a second. This is the clear layer. It shows up, it kind of looks a bit glassy. Um, and we see this only in thick skin. So you know how sometimes when you get calluses, um, the calluses can look a little bit shiny. And sometimes when the skin peels on a callus, it kind of has a clearish um, shiny look to it. This is because of the stratum lucidum. So again, we only see this layer in thick skin, which is why thin skin only has four layers of strata because it doesn't have this one. Okay, so going back to our picture, we saw the granulosum was the last one we looked at, which is here. It shows up a little darker. And then very thin layer on top of the granulosum is the lucidum, which is only in thick skin. So that leaves this huge layer that goes from here all the way up to there which is the stratum corneum, stratum corneum. So again, if you touch your own skin, you're touching the stratum corneum. This is your exposed skin. It is water resistant and has about 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells. So remember that means we, when we've keratinized, we have formed protective layers of cells filled with keratin, which is the water resistant protein. It also makes the cells a little tougher and more rigid. New cells that are made in the stratum basal, it takes them about seven to 10 days to get up to the corneum. Exposed cells are shed after about two weeks. So you are constantly shedding skin so we've got to constantly be building up new skin. Water is lost from the skin in two ways. One way is called insensible perspiration. This is when water diffuses across the corneum and evaporates from the skin. You lose about 500 milliliters per day through insensible perspiration. Sensible perspiration is what we call the water excreted by our sweat glands. So now that we've talked about the epidermis, we can go a little deeper to the dermis. The dermis is located between the epidermis and the subcutaneous or hypodermis layer. It will anchor accessory structures like hair, follicles, and sweat glands. And there are two parts to the, to the dermis. We have a papillary layer and a reticular layer. The papillary layer is the topmost portion of the dermis. And it's made mainly of areolar tissue. We talked about areolar tissue in chapter four. Areolar tissue is a type of loose connective tissue proper. Um, it's going to have in it capillaries, lymphatic vessels, and sensory neurons. It is named papillary because it is named for those dermal papilla we talked about that are between um, the epidermal ridges. We'll look at a picture of this too. Reticular layer is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. Again, throw back to chapter four. That one's really helpful as we start talking about other organs and organ systems. Um, dense, irregular connective tissue we talked about has a lot of fibers in it that make it very stretchy and tough. Um, the fibers in the reticular layer are specifically collagen and elastic fibers. The dermis contains all cells of connective tissue proper. So again, in chapter four, we, we gave a list of cells that we can see 
um, in certain types of connective tissue proper. And what we're saying here is that the dermis has all of those mixed into it. So going back to look at a picture of the dermis, we'll have to go back a little ways. We can see those two layers that we just mentioned. So epidermis we went through, that's where the strata are. And then the dermis is pretty thick. And we've got at the top the papillary layer, which is where those dermal papilla are found, right in there. And then from there to the bottom, we have the reticular layer, and that has a lot of fibers in it. And you can see the, the stretchy collagen and elastic fibers here running back and forth in the dermis. Okay, so back to more dermis stuff. So the dermal strength and elasticity um, is due to lots and lots of collagen. It's very strong and can stretch and bend and twist. Um, and this, now there is a limit to it. We can stretch too far and we can actually damage the collagen, but we have quite a bit of bounce because of that collagen. Elastic fibers allow us to stretch and recoil to the original link, so that gives us a lot of bounce back and flexibility. The fibers and water in our skin provide flexibility and resilience. We call that skin turgor. Skin damage, um, loss of skin turgor is caused by dehydration, which is totally reversible, aging, unfortunately, and hormones as well as radiation. So if we are in the sun too much, um, that can actually cause premature wrinkling because too much UV radiation damages the collagen and elastic fibers, which makes your skin look a bit wrinkly and more saggy and leathery quicker than it does naturally as we age. Excessive distortion of our skin from pregnancy or weight gain can cause stretch marks. So stretch marks are when we have stretched the skin past its elastic capabilities and we've actually torn the collagen and elastic fibers. And aren't stretch marks just the worst? Yeah, they're awful. So this is a picture of, under an electron microscope, of collagen and elastic fibers in the dermis. And you can see that it is quite an intricate web of collagen and elastic fibers. And that again is what's gonna give our skin the elasticity that it has. So tension lines or cleavage lines are produced by bundles of collagen and elastic fibers in the dermis. They resist forces applied to the skin and they look like this. So someone worked out where the lines of cleavage are in the skin. So in other words, what direction the collagen and elastic fibers run in different areas of the skin. And this is universal, so this would be the case for you and me and everyone else. And because we know this mapping of collagen and elastic fibers, it can actually be helpful in determining the best way to make incisions during surgery. So a cut made parallel or with the lines of cleavage is less likely to open and will heal much nicer and, and hopefully have less of a scar. Now if we cut across or against the lines of cleavage, then once the wound attempts to heal, those collagen and elastic fibers that we cut across will tug at the incision, making it more likely to reopen and or get infected and possibly a nastier scar. So that again, the tension lines or lines of cleavage. So since the epithelial part of the skin, which is our epidermis, does not have blood vessels in it, it must receive all nutrients and oxygen by way of diffusion. So the dermis is going to have a very rich blood supply. It's got a cutaneous plexus, which is a deep network of arteries along the reticular layer of the dermis. 
and a subpapillary, so right under the papilla plexus, which is a network of small arteries in the papillary layer. And there are capillaries that will drain into small veins that lead to larger veins down in the subcutaneous layer. So I'll show you what those guys look like. And a contusion is a bruise. So this would be caused by damage to blood vessels in the dermis, and those blood vessels would bleed out into the dermis, which can cause a bruise. So here's a picture that shows us um, the blood vessels in the dermis and the two uh, plexus that we brought up. So deep we have the cutaneous plexus and these are large vessels down deep which makes sense. We want large vessels as far away from the surface as we can so that if we get cut we don't cut through those. And then you can see that we have smaller branches coming off of these large vessels forming a subpapillary plexus which is a smaller network of blood vessels closer to the epidermis. And then small capillary loops that go right up to the edge of the epidermis and come back down again. All of these drain back down to the vein in the cutaneous plexus. So there is a loop that they take and as we head up close to the epidermis, we'll be able to diffuse oxygen and nutrients right into the epidermis without actually crossing into it. So there are also nerves in your skin um, that control blood flow and adjust gland secretion rates. They also monitor sensation. So we certainly have a lot of feeling in our skin. Um, and these receptors are, we have a couple here listed, the light touch um, would be the Meissner corpuscles in the dermal papilla. Deep pressure and vibration are known as Pacinian corpuscles and those are found in the reticular layer, so deeper down. So we move now into the subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis. It's deep to the dermis and connected to the reticular layer by connective tissue. It helps to stabilize the position of the skin and is mostly fat or adipose tissue. There are large arteries and veins in it. And so this is where it's a great place to give subcutaneous injections using hypodermic needles. So if we inject at this level here, then we're able to get into circulation um, quickly through these large vessels. The distribution of subcutaneous fat is determined by sex hormones. So here is an um, electron microscope view of the subcutaneous layer, and you can see that the majority of what we can see here, these round objects, those are adipocytes, um, and chapter 4 told us that that meant fat cells. So skin color can be influenced by two main pigments in the epidermis. We have melanin and carotene. So let's start with melanin. So melanin can be red-yellow or brown-black pigment. It's produced by melanocytes, which are in the stratum basal. And the differences in skin pigments do not actually reflect different levels of melanocytes, but how much melanin is actually made. So a darker skinned person doesn't necessarily have more melanocytes, but their melanocytes produce more melanin than a fair skinned person. Melanocytes produce melanin and store it in vesicles called melanosomes, which are transferred to keratinocytes. Dark skinned people have large, numerous melanosomes. So we'll take a look at that too in a picture. And melanin protects your skin from ultraviolet radiation. So small amounts of UV radiation are beneficial. We'll talk about why when we get to calcium and vitamin D. 
but too much UV radiation can damage your DNA and cause cancer. So let's go forward a little here to look at this picture of the skin under the microscope. And so right down here where my arrow is, this is the stratum basal, so the bottom of the epidermis. And you can see there's kind of a brownish pigment here. That's the melanocytes which produce melanin. And that melanin you can see here showing up is actually brownish. So if we zoom in a little, this cell that looks a bit like an octopus, it has all these tentacles coming off of it, the, this is the melanocyte. And you can see in its tentacles, it's producing melanin pigment. And the melanin pigment is being released either freely, as we see here, or it's being released in these vesicles called melanosomes. Okay, and melanocytes can produce more or release more melanin when skin cells are exposed to ultraviolet radiation. So let's take a look at how that helps out. So this is one of my illustrations from my study guide. Um, and it just kind of simplifies it down and to, makes it a little cartoony, which I really like because it kind of lightens up this difficult topic of anatomy. But we have here a skin cell and there's our nucleus where we keep our precious DNA. And as UV radiation penetrates our skin, that radiation passes through the nucleus and can damage or mutate our DNA. Melanocytes produce these melanin pigments which will actually move in front of the nucleus. And what that does is it acts as a shield against UV radiation. So as UV radiation comes down, it is deflected or made less dramatic by the melanin pigment which is protecting the DNA. So if you already naturally have a lot of melanin in your skin you've got great protection. That does not mean that you should not protect yourself with sunscreen or that you should never worry about getting too much sun. Everyone should worry about that but fair skin people who don't have as much of this melanin in the skin are much more susceptible to the dangers of skin cancer even than a naturally dark-skinned person would be. So the melanin pigments again help shield the nucleus from UV radiation, sort of like an umbrella over the skin cell protecting it. Okay, so keratin is an orange yellow pigment found in orange vegetables. So some good places to find carotene would be pumpkins, certain types of squash, and also carrots, sweet potatoes. And when we get carotene, and by the way, carotene sounds a lot like keratin, but clearly they're not the same thing. So be careful about that. Um, carotene accumulates in epidermal cells deep dermis and subcutaneous layer and in fair-skinned people if we get a whole lot of carotene like you go crazy on sweet potatoes um, like way more than normal then your skin can actually take on an orange yellow hue in certain areas um, and it can be very apparent. Carotene can also be converted to vitamin A which is required for maintenance of your epithelia. So skin color can also be influenced by blood flow and oxygen levels. Hemoglobin is a protein in your blood that carries oxygen. It's bright red when it is bound to oxygen. When blood vessels dilate from, the, from heat, skin reddens. So when you get really hot, your blood vessels dilate to allow heat to be released across the skin. And this makes your skin look a bit rosier. When blood flow to the skin decreases, skin looks more pale. Hemoglobin turns dark red when oxygen is released. This can result in cyanosis, which is bluish skin. 
and that can be caused by extreme cold, heart failure, or asthma. So vitamin D is produced by epidermal cells in the presence of UV radiation. So we talked about how a little bit is good, but too much can be dangerous. The liver and the kidneys together convert vitamin D into something called calcitriol. Calcitriol is essential for absorption of calcium and phosphate ions by the small intestine. So if we want to have strong bones, we need calcitriol. And we can't get calcitriol unless we have a little bit of UV radiation so that we can convert our vitamin D. If you don't have enough vitamin D or vitamin D3, um, this can cause rickets. Rickets can cause bending of the bones and make them a bit more flexible, which can cause some deformity, as you can see here, under the weight of the body. So good calcium levels, very important to strong bones. Okay, so next we're going to look at the accessory structures of the skin, like the hair, hair follicles, sebaceous sweat glands, and nails. They're derived from the embryonic epidermis, located in the dermis, but project to the skin surface. So let's start with hair. Hair covers almost all of the body except for your palms, sides of your fingers, sides and soles of your feet, sides of toes, lips, and portions of your external genitalia. Functions of the hair are to protect and insulate guard openings from particles and also insects and they can help with sensory reception. So hair follicles go deep into the dermis and produce non-living hair. So hair is not actually alive. Um, it's a collection of protein that's being squeezed out of a tube which is why it has a strand shape. It's wrapped in dense connective tissue, sheath, and the base is surrounded by nerves, which we call the root hair plexus. There is, in addition, a muscle that attaches to the hair called the erector pili, which is involuntary, and it causes hairs to stand up when you have um, what we call goosebumps. regions of the hair we have the root which is what anchors it into the skin and the shaft which is the upper part of the hair that eventually is exposed out of the skin so here's some of the things we talked about so far um, so this would be the root of the hair which is deep in the dermis and then up here we have the shaft of the hair here is our erector pili muscle. And then surrounding the hair is the connective tissue sheath. This is a cross section through the hair, um, and it'll actually help for us to go over the next slide before we go through the the next couple of slides before we go through those pictures of the cross section. So the hair has a core which is called the medulla and it is made of soft keratin. The cortex surrounds the medulla and is made of hard keratin and then the outermost covering of the hair is called the cuticle which is a kind of a shaggy thin coating on the hair. So we'll take a look at all of those. And hair production begins at the hair bulb, which is found at the bottom of the follicle. It surrounds the hair papilla, which has capillaries and nerves. And at the base of the hair, the cells form a layer known as the hair matrix, which produces hair. As cells divide, hair is pushed up and out of the skin. So let's take a look at all those parts in this picture here. So we've got a cross section through a hair starting at the core. This would be the medulla, which is made up of soft 
keratin, which again is protein. Then we have cortex, which is made of hard keratin that gives hair the stiffness. Then we have a thin layer called the cuticle, which is, which is tough and protective. Okay, and then from there, all the way out to there would be the follicle. So looking at the close-up of the hair, we have down at the bottom the hair bulb, the hair papilla, is where our blood vessels are, the hair matrix, this is where the hair is going to originate, Then we've got the medulla, which is the core, and the cortex, which is around the core, followed by the cuticle, which is the outermost, and then we've got follicle. So as hair grows, the root is firmly attached to the matrix of the follicle, but when the follicle becomes inactive, growth stops. Hair is now called a club hair. When a new hair growth cycle begins, the follicle will produce the new hair and the club hair will be pushed out or shed. So there are a couple of types of hair. We have vellus hair, which is soft and fine and colorless. Um, so this would be what you find um, on on ladies on your face it's like peach fuzz um, on your again ladies on your neck on your chest on your back all peach fuzz very soft and fine terminal hair is heavy pigmented hair so this would be like on the head eyebrows eyelashes and other parts of the body after puberty Hair color is produced by melanocytes at the hair matrix and is determined by your genes. Okay, so moving on to glands. Exocrine glands in the skin. Remember that exocrine means we secrete through a duct. We have sebaceous glands, which are oil glands. And they are holocrine. So again, back to chapter 4. Holocrine meaning that the cells release the product, which would be oil, but the cells explode. They open up and spill out their contents with the product. These glands discharge a lipid secretion, which is known as sebum. That's the oil. Either onto hair when they are associated with hair and that will help to protect the hair and also inhibits growth of bacteria. Oil glands can also not be associated with hair and they can just put oil right onto the surface of the skin um, and you would definitely um, have those on your face. So again, sebaceous glands can be associated with hair or not associated with hair and discharge oil directly onto the skin. We have these on our face, back, chest, nipples, and external genitalia. So here's an image of the two types. We have the, the oil gland that is stuck to the hair, so it would release oil right onto the hair shaft. And then we have one that releases oil right onto the skin surface. Okay, so we've got sweat glands, which can be apocrine or eccrine. Apocrine sweat glands are found in the armpits, around the nipples, and in the pubic region. And the name is a bit misleading. Um, they secrete products into hair follicles by way of merocrine secretion. So in Chapter 4, we also talked about the difference between merocrine and apocrine. Merocrine is when we secrete something from a cell by way of exocytosis. Apocrine is when we secrete a product with a pinch of cytoplasm. 
So it was first believed that these sweat glands were apocrine, but we now know that they're not actually true apocrine sweat glands, but the name stuck. So they're called apocrine sweat glands, but they secrete by way of merocrine secretion. These type of sweat glands produce a sticky, cloudy sweat. And this sticky, cloudy sweat is a great nutrient source for bacteria. The bacteria feed on this sweat and the bacteria release gases which cause odors. And so that's what we affectionately call body odor or BO. Um, and we definitely know that these kind of sweat glands live in the armpit. These sweat glands are surrounded by myoepithelial cells, which are cells that cause this, a squeezing of these secretions out of the gland in response to hormones or nervous signals. So here is an apocrine sweat gland right here associated with a hair. So like in your armpit, for example, we also have the other type of sweat gland called eccrine or merocrine sweat glands. And these are coiled glands that discharge directly onto the skin and we call that sensible perspiration. So this is not smelly sweat like the other one. This is widely distributed on your body and is especially on palms and soles of feet, um, palms of hands and soles of feet. The secretions are 99% water plus salt. And the function of this sweating is to help cool your skin, to reduce body temperature, to excrete water and electrolytes, and also can protect you from environmental hazards. So if you get some kind of chemical on your skin or some kind of... Um, any kind of toxin on your skin, um, sweat can help to dilute it so it's not as dangerous. So that's what we mean by protection from environmental hazards. So here is the merocrine or eccrine sweat gland that releases the non-smelly sweat onto the surface of the skin. So some other integumentary glands include mammary glands which produce milk, and ceruminous glands which produce earwax. Earwax will prevent foreign particles from reaching the eardrum. So earwax is a good thing. Um, coating the ear canal to keep foreign particles from reaching the eardrum. So nails protect the tips of your fingers and toes and they too are made of dead cells packed with keratin the structure of a nail is the nail body, which is the visible portion of the nail that covers the nail bed. The sides of the nail lie in nail grooves and are surrounded by nail folds. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. The skin beneath the free edge of the nail is known as the hyponychium. Okay. So looking at this picture, we'll look at a couple of those things we talked about. So right along the edges, right here and right there, we have the nail fold. That's the skin that folds up against the nail. This is the nail body. And this is the free edge of the nail. So this would be a slice through the finger. And so now you are looking down um, the finger. So here's the finger bone right there. And then this would be the nail, the nail body. So here are the nail grooves there and there. And then here and here are the nail folds. So nail production occurs in an epidermal fold called the nail root. The deepest part of this root is very close to the bone and the visible nail emerges from under part of the nail root known as the cuticle, that's what most of us call it, but it's officially known as the epinichium. Near the root, blood vessels are obscured 
which produces a pale area called the lunula or luna moon, named for the moon. So here's the lunula, the pale crescent area named after the moon. And down here where the cuticle is, this is the epinichium. Epinichium is the cuticle. And under that is where we would see the nail root, where the nail grows from. So here's a side view of the nail and some of those things we just talked about. So we've got the nail root down here where the nail er originates. The lanula would be about in this area and this would be the nail body. Here's the cuticle, epinichium. And we said the hyponychium was the um, tissue that held the free edge of the nail down. You can see a little piece of it right there. So repair of the integument. So if you get a cut, how do we fix it? The repair of the integument following an injury will begin with bleeding, swelling, and pain. Mast cells will trigger inflammation, which means an increased blood flow to the area. A scab, which is a dried blood clot, will stabilize and protect the area so it'll basically seal it off so we can't get more germs or bacteria into the cut and it also slows down the bleeding. Macrophages clean the area. Fibroblast and endothelial cells will divide producing granulation tissue. So let's look at that step by step. So here we have um, the initial cut and you can see that the cut is pretty deep. It's going through the epidermis all the way down towards the hypodermis or subcutaneous area. Bleeding is occurring and immediately after the injury mast cells will trigger, these are mast cells, they will trigger an inflammatory response. After a while a scab has formed which has sealed off the wound and awesomely, the cells of the stratum basal way up in the epidermis begin to migrate along the perimeter of the cut. So we're going all the way down. And we're going to go down and get under that cut, actually. Meanwhile, phagocytic cells are removing debris and more cells are arriving with the enhanced circulation or inflammation. About a week later, the scab has been undermined by epidermal cells. So remember those cells migrated along the perimeter of the cut? Once they get all the way under the cut, they begin to divide, 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 pushing up, healing from the inside out, which we see here and they are migrating over the collagen meshwork being produced by fibroblasts. So fibroblasts are here making collagen to repair the area. Phagocytic activity is almost done. Remember phagocytosis means to engulf, so we're cleaning up debris or bacteria that have gotten into the wound and the fibrin clot is beginning to dissolve. So the scab is getting smaller, it's starting to dissolve. After several weeks, the scab has shed and the epidermis is complete. We may see a shallow depression where the injury was, but fibroblasts will continue to create scar tissue that will gradually elevate that epidermis to make it look a little nicer. Now we may always have a scar depending on how bad um, the cut was, but over time it will improve in the way that it looks in most cases. So the effects of aging on your skin. Um, the epidermis will thin. Vitamin D3 production will decline. Blood supply to the dermis is reduced. Function of hair follicles declines. The dermis will thin and elastic fiber network will shrink. 
and repair rate will slow. Isn't that uplifting? So join us in the next chapter, which is going to be chapter 6 over osseous tissue. This concludes chapter 5 over the integumentary system.